if I'm an, an investor and I want to buy a stock, I can't just go buy a stock for 20% less than it's worth. Yeah. But in real estate, I can. And that's what I love about real estate is you can provide a service that people need and want and um, get a great deal and make a profit at the same time. Hey everyone, this is Trevor with Investor Carrot coming at you with another Carrot Cast. And on today's Carrot Cast, I'm crazy excited to have with us uh, Martin, one of our clients, but also uh, one of the things that, that I'm really passionate about outside of business, outside of, of Carrot, is athletics, is high performance. And Martin's got a really unique background that you guys are going to be able to um, get a brief glimpse on his background from the Olympics to real estate investing. And, uh, and he's, he's been having a lot of success in his market. You know, we're just fortunate enough, uh, enough to be able to start working with him the last six months or so. And, uh, and one really cool thing that we'll kind of touch on probably as we get in is that uh, Martin has been a direct mail guy um, you know, historically with this business. And then he jumped in with Carrot and he just closed his first online deal. And we'd, we're going to walk through kind of how that happened. So for those of you who are doing direct mail, Martin's an insanely great resource for you who's doing very well in the Phoenix market and now up in the Michigan market. Um, but also, like many of you, he started to transition some of that effort over to the web to see how he can stack on and scale things up. And like I said, we're, all, we're definitely going to, there's no way I'm going to let Martin get out of here without talking about some of the high performance stuff. Because um, that's something I know that he still is a guy who stays in shape. He still is a guy who believes in physical fitness, but also high performance. And I want to really find out how that impacts him as an entrepreneur, how that impacts him in business. So Martin, welcome to the call, man. And I really appreciate the heck out of you coming on the call. And just so people know how to spell your last name, dude, spell it <laughs> out because if people want to Google you up, it's definitely different than it sounds a little bit. But uh, Martin, welcome on the call. Well, thanks, Trevor. It's great to be here. As far as my last name goes, it's kind of funny you say that about Google because it's probably misspelled more, more than it's spelled right online. So uh -huh. if you spell it right, that might actually limit your search, but it's spelled B as a boy, O-O-N-Z-A-A-Y-E-R. So there's two O's and two A's. It's a real Dutch giveaway. You know, like I always tell people about Roosevelt, you know, that's a good Dutch name too. So uh -huh. anyway, my last cool. name's Bonesire. People always ask how it's pronounced. And so there you go. Yep. Martin Bonesire. So, so. welcome, welcome on the call, man. And I really appreciate you coming on. Like, I, uh, like I said, because when, when we first connected, um, uh, you know, I, I come from that athletic background and anytime I, I see someone who comes from an athletic background, especially someone in a highly competitive background, it always definitely attracts me to you because I'm going, okay, so this person kind of talks my language a little bit, whether it's athletics or not, just the high performer. Um, and also what really attracts me to that type of person is you get stuff done. You know, you tend not to kind of sit there and and, and twiddle, you know, twiddle your thumbs around moving <laughs> stuff forward. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today that we'll get into a little bit later is how you really dove into the online stuff with us. I mean, you weren't sitting there kind of like contemplating what to do and hacking your way through stuff. You actually had other people help you with some stuff, a VA, which we'll get into that kind of stuff here in a bit to help, help you get that deal uh, through the web. But man, let's dive into your, your story a little bit more because how, how does someone go from uh, the highly competitive world of Olympic athletics um, to real estate, but even going back further, um, you know, what is your background and, and what did you do in the Olympics and kind of what was that transition right after the Olympics? Okay, sure. So my background academically is actually engineering. I yeah. got an undergrad in uh, computer engineering and a master's degree in electrical engineering. And, um, so while I was, uh, in, actually I started in judo as a boy, but my parents never really encouraged competition, but I've just always been a very competitive person. I enjoy competing and I just, enjoy something more when I just put everything into it. I'm, 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 I just don't enjoy kind of the, I'm not the weekend warrior kind of, kind of types. Um, as far as, you know, Hey, let's go do a little of this, a little of that. I just personally enjoy something more when I'm all in. So rather than dabble in a lot of little things, I like to just go all in on something. And so when I started doing judo at a competitive level, I went all in. My coach inspired me, believed that I could make the Olympics in 1996, and actually I did not make it that year, And uh, but uh, continued on uh, and was able to make the team in 2000 and then again in 2004. So, But the kind of the funny thing is, is after my first Olympics, 
and I was working at Motorola as an engineer at the time, mm -hmm. and they were just really awesome. They sponsored me. They gave me like six months off prior to the Olympics to uh, to focus on my training. And uh, but after that, I started to realize, wow, I'm in a cubicle all day long, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not. I'm not sure that this is the future for me. Yeah. So I, I uh, actually I've done a number of different things. Uh, I've sold vitamins, I sold health insurance, I got my securities license and looked at maybe doing investments and uh but uh, kind of through that whole process I was buying real estate. Not a lot, but I bought uh, a property and then turned it into a rental and bought another house and anyway, I just really always really liked the idea of real estate investing. And so about 8 years ago, my wife wanted to move back to Phoenix where she is from and uh we decided, well, what better time to get into real estate investing full time. So it's kind of a trial by fire because as you know, 2008 is kind of when everything really uh, fell apart here in Phoenix. But uh, in a way, it was truly a great time to get started because it forced me to learn how to to uh, do deals right. Um, and uh, you couldn't just rely on, on just the, over, you know, in 2005, anybody could make money in real estate. And so that uh, was kind of a trial by fire, and I'm really thankful that I got started that way because I, I, I really believe it's what helped me build the base on where my business is today. Man, so in, in, in the Phoenix market, when, when the market took that dive, you know, in 9, 10, around there, you know, even 11, what were you doing? What, what were you focusing on in the, on the real estate side? Well, I started out like a lot of people just buying at the trustee sale, and that worked great for a while, but even back in 2011, some of the hedge funds were starting to come in and starting to buy, and I didn't want to compete with them. And that's what got me into direct mail. I started doing direct mail. My first niche was probate. And so I started sending, I sent, I figured out it's nothing really fancy. I went to the courthouse, asked them what the probate process was, and figured out how to filter that information that I needed, uh, how to get it. And so I then hired a girl to go to the courthouse and do that for me every week. And I started sending letters. It took time, but um, I started getting really good deals because people knew the real estate market was terrible. They were inheriting this property um, and they wanted nothing to do with it. And so they were willing to sell to me at a discount just to get this problem property in a problem area, in a problem market off their hands. And that's really how I got started in the probate market. And since then, I've just loved direct mail. I figure... Uh, you know, if, if I'm a, an investor and I want to buy a stock, I can't just go buy a stock for 20% less than it's worth. Yeah. But in real estate, I can. And that's what I love about real estate is you can provide a service that people need and want and um, get a great deal and make a profit at the same time. So what are you, what are you doing in, in this market right now on, on the direct mail side, if you don't mind sharing? Because I know um, we'll hear from a lot of people who are doing direct mail and the response rates have gone down as, market, as the market has heated up. Are you doing anything differently now than you were a couple of years ago on the direct mail side to crack through? Well, yeah, for sure. I've, I've, I've ramped up considerably. I send a lot more mail than I used to, and I get a lower response rate than I used to. There's no question it's more competitive. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that's been kind of interesting, and I've, I've really worked with my team on this, is the more we try to be competitive, and this would be kind of my, my tip out there because I hear it from everybody. Oh, it's too competitive. It's too competitive. Uh, the more we try to compete on price, the more we get beat up on price. Mm -hmm. I just, my, uh, I just had an appointment today uh, that I, I don't often go on appointments myself with sellers. I really miss it, but so I did go on one today, and I'm confident that my offer was the lowest by far. <laughs> uh, but I, I, and I don't, I could be wrong, but just like that deal you were alluding to earlier, that nice big deal we got off of SEO through the, your Carrot website. I'm pretty confident we're going to get this deal because this guy wants to do business with somebody that's reputable and can solve his problem. Mm -hmm. And just like if you go into, I don't know, I'm trying to use an example. Um, if you want to buy, if you want to go out to eat, you can buy a steak for $10, you can buy a steak for $30. Mm -hmm. Are you going to always buy the $10 steak? Probably not. It's, it's worth paying more because you're going to have a better experience. Yep. And people associate price with quality. And so the reverse is true in – or the same, but on the flip side is true in buying houses. By coming in with a lower price with a professional 
presentation without beating around the bush and being really candid with them saying, you know, I'm probably not going to be your highest offer, but here's the reason people do business with us. You know what? People go for it because mm-hmm. they do want that simple, clean, safe, fast solution. And that's what we provide. And we just, we don't try to beat around the bush. We don't try to beat everybody on price and it really works. You know, man, I, I heard a great, great analogy from a, a good friend of mine. name is Ben Settle. He's a, he's a copywriter and he's a great, great marketer. And I think he might have heard this from someone else too. And one thing that, that a lot of us do initially is we, we, we take those things that we see as detractors in our product and our offering or whatever it is, right? In this case, a lot of people look at it going, oh my gosh, I'm coming in with the lowest price. That's something that I don't want to point that out to them so it's obvious, right? That's, what, that's what's pe- what someone's first impression is. And you mentioned in there that you said, you know what, um, we're saying, you know, Telling them obviously we're not low on lowest in price, or we're not the highest in price, but here's why you should work with us. The analogy that Ben gave me, he said, he said in marketing and business, everyone's got skeletons in their closets, right? And the <laughs> skeleton could be a deficiency in your product that's maybe not a deficiency, but it's just not as fancy as this other product has. It It could be a feature is a little bit different, or it could be your price is way higher, or price is way lower, or quality is different, or time of delivery of the service or whatever is long or short, whatever it is, right? And we all have those. And by our first impression is to hide them, like throw the skeletons back in the closet and let's just point out all of our great stuff, right? And, and he said, when you can take those skeletons out of the closet and not just take them out and show them to your customer, but make them dance, because then they start to become a selling point for you instead mm-hmm. of a detractor. Because he goes, if, if, the, if the customer finds those skeletons without you showing them, then they think that they found a deficiency. If you show them to them, now it's a strength on your side. And that's exactly what you're doing is you're showing them that, that thing that could be perceived as, as a, um, a, a lack of a benefit. And you're showing them why that actually is giving them a better benefit. You're making the skeleton dance. And I love it. Oh, that's awesome. I got to remember that. That's Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> no, it's it's good. I, I love it, man. And on on that on that on that thread there. So you're talking about going in there and 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 becoming more professional and and, and showing them that, that you're reputable and things like that. What are some of the things that you guys are doing to do that? Because there is a lot of competition out there, and you probably weren't the you know there was probably at least three, four, or five other people who were uh, making offers on it. What are you guys doing to stand out? Well, a few things. One, I think the um, uh, the website really helps. It's a credibility resource. Even if people aren't finding us by the website, they're finding us through direct mail. We always direct them to our website after they call in to check us out. So they can see the testimonials. They can see, uh, they can learn more about us. And uh, I also, a number of years ago, I spent quite a bit of money and had a webinar created to present our service. And with people watch that webinar, our sales ratio goes up substantially. I wish I could have a specific number. Unfortunately, I don't track it really well. I'm in the process of changing systems so I can track those types of things better. Um, But when people watch that webinar, our closing ratio goes up substantially and they will tell us things like, you know, you're not the best, you're not the highest offer, but I want to sell to you anyway because I really like you. I really like that webinar. I really, you know, all of those things kind of add to the credibility. I think also too some basics like, you know, I insist that my salespeople show up with with monogram shirts, you know, something that communicates our uh, our company and our brand. Um, we dress professionally. Always wear dress shoes. Uh, even in Phoenix, we're wearing long pants. And the sun. Uh, none of I don't know that it matters a whole lot, but I personally feel like it matters. I feel like it sets us a little bit apart. We're not just some guy in shorts and flip flops saying, "Yeah, man, I'll give you this for your house," mm-hmm. you know. And so um, I believe it's kind of a a consistency in branding. We just want to be a step above. We're looking for the, we want our client to be somebody that wants, that is willing to take a little less to do business with somebody who's does business a little better, mm-hmm. <laughs> more professional, more confidence, more secure. I mean, in all we're talking about here, so, you know, the, the cost of a monogram t-shirt isn't much. Um, you know, the, the having the nice business cards, isn't much. Some the people no, probably already, they're probably already getting those made anyway. Um, and really, it's not like the, the stuff you guys are doing. It's not like it's this huge extra expense. It's just taking the time to to create this cohesive brand, like you said, that, that is credible. Well, and it's not only that. If I could, speaking of this appointment I was just at, 
um, I there's a guy that's coming in after me, and he called while I was meeting with the seller, hmm. and I could hear over the phone that he's apologizing to be 30 minutes late, and I put that into my pitch. I said, you know. Um, I was here on time. Actually, I was a few minutes early. I ex- respect your time. I value your time. And just the way I respected your time by being here when I said I would, we'll also close this deal the way we said we would. Dude, that's awesome right there. So, I love that. So I, I, and I could see the guy. Anyway, he really latched onto that. Mm-hmm. So the way you present yourself and li- sometimes what some people call little things like being on time, how you look, it's, it's extremely important. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but, uh, you know, you talked about me having a sports background and I've always, people ask all the time, well, what does it take to be successful in sports? And I think it's the same thing in business in the, at the core of it. And that is 95% of it is just showing up. Most people just won't show up consistently. I didn't want to show up every day at practice, but I did. And by showing up, then the mind shifts and you get into it and you get the improvement. Uh, so much of life, in my opinion, is showing up. And so in this business, if you just sh- – when I talk about showing up, obviously we're talk- I'm not just talking about showing up at an appointment. I'm talking about showing up the way we're talking about. Just dotting your I's, crossing your T's, just being – living the part. And um, just too many people, they want a quick fix. They want to go to a seminar. They want to send out a few mailings and then they want to make a bunch of money and they're not willing to just show up consistently in all of the little things. And that's really over time. There's that cumulative effect. Man, that's, that's huge. Um, I, I was watching this, this YouTube video. It's probably like a year. I was shoot. It was like three or four years ago. So I watch it every, every quarter now. And it was this guy who was like a four or five star general or whatever it was, you know, way high up in the ranks. And he was doing a commencement speech at a college. And the commencement speech, and what you're saying is directly in line with this, and it really hit me, was he started to talk about the little things. He was saying, you know, when I showed up to, to boot camp, um, I, didn't ex- I, I expected to learn how to go to war. You know, I didn't expect to learn how to, how to fold my sheets and how to uh, uh, you know, iron my clothes this certain way and how to do this and do that. He said, when you first go into boot camp, um, a lot of times the guys resent that. They're like, we're here to go to war. We're here to learn how to, you know, how to be warriors and, and how to protect our country. Why are we doing this stuff? You know, why, why are we kind of piddling around with it? He said, you start to create that routine. It's like you said, you, you, you dot the I's, you cross the T's, and you show up. And then he said when it really hit him was when they actually went to war. You know, when they actually went to war and, and you didn't have to think about those small things. Those small things were no longer even in your mind because they became so routine that you were doing them right. You didn't, you didn't have to worry about it. If you're going to wake up in the morning and fold your bed perfectly and iron everything, all those small things, you're probably going to do a lot more of those during the day mm-hmm. and right. So when you have the big thing, when you're in war and you're in that foxhole, he said, I could tell you uh, firsthand that I wanted to be in the foxhole with those people who were doing the small things right every day. I didn't want to be in the foxhole with the guy who couldn't shine his shoes because it all adds up to the big decisions. And it seemed like yeah. it's very, very similar here. If you're yeah. not doing the small things, it makes it harder to, to, to do the big things. Right. That's awesome, man. So transitioning over into kind of where you guys are, are right now with your business. So um, so we can give people a little bit of perspective. If you don't just share whatever the heck you're comfortable with sharing, Kind of what site? What's your business look like right now? What What's your team look like? Um, what kind of volume are you are you guys? I know you guys are in multiple markets right now. Like to share whatever the heck you guys are comfortable sharing, but this will give people perspective for where you are in your journey in your business. Sure. So um, about a year ago, I made the decision to expand, mm-hmm. and um, and the reason for that was is I wanted to uh, well a num- several reasons, but I wanted to have a lifestyle that included in being involved with people that I enjoyed working with. And when my business was small, it was a, well, it's kind of a lonely business. You know, you're kind of going out there doing your thing. There's not a lot of, um, anyway, um, professional involvement other than perhaps getting together with other investors, which I do periodically as well and really enjoy. But I wanted to have more interaction. So, um, and I, I feel like Part of my strengths are I, I enjoy coaching, mentoring, training, and I wanted to have an environment to make that kind of contribution in my own company. Mm-hmm. So, uh, But of course, if you're going to have quality people in your life that want to earn a good income, you have to – well, I had to scale up in order to support that. So mm-hmm. there you go. Um, 
and we started going down that path about a year ago, and I'm just really excited about our progress. It's been a tough journey, but uh, we're in two markets right now. Um, our Michigan market's doing exceedingly well. We're bringing in probably about 15 contracts a month. Uh, we'll see how that continues, and we're, we haven't even hit our full list yet. So we've got, a, I think, a lot of opportunity there. We're looking at several other markets. Our vision is to be in four to five markets within the next 12 months. Uh, our goal is to do... 10 deals a month in each market. And uh, we feel that that's very sustainable and doable. And um, so that's what we're uh, we kind of got our heads down and focused on uh, achieving. I love it, man. So, so when you went into the Grand Rapids market, the Michigan market, um, is, is your is your guys' go-to-market strategy, was it straight to direct mail? Hey, we've got these certain lists that are working, these certain campaigns that are working in Phoenix and just kind of duplicating that? Or did you guys have to adjust any of it when you went into that market? Well, um, you know, I'm using a lot of the same mail. Uh, the list I get, I, there's a gentleman that um, he and it, he has a partner. They're data whizzes. I buy the data and the list from them. Um, I believe I'm a big believer in paying professionals uh, to get uh, professional results. So I don't do my own taxes. I don't do my own oil. You know, oil change. And uh, same thing for my list. I believe lists are a very valuable resource, and so I pay a professional to get me good data and I've been using that data with great success. So I don't really, I believe I can use that same model. Now with that said, the type of people that respond, the type of properties are very different and you have to have the ability to, to adapt and modify. But that's, um, I think any real estate professional can make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. Dude, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You don't have to share it, but on that list, that list source, is it a resource you, you mind sharing or is that kind of one secret under wraps for you? <laughs> well, I know. Um, you know, yeah, it's up to you, man. You know what? I, I'm. I don't have a problem sharing. I know he restricts access to one person in whatever market, so you pay a uh, premium for that. His name is Chris Richter. I don't know what his website is, but uh, if somebody wants to look him up, I'm sure they can find him. Cool. That's awesome resource. So Martin's already got the Phoenix market locked down, and some other ones, guys. So if you wanna wanna connect with Chris Richter, just Google him and find him, and uh, and let know let him know where you found out about him. From uh, Martin, so as far as when you're when you're expanding, one of those expansion plans, of course, was that's kind of how we connected uh, through the um, through Carrot, and uh, I know we connected through Collective Genius, just through that amazing network of people, and I think it was probably from Brad Chandler is where that I'm trying to think back on yeah. how that how that happened, um, but it seems like that's that's a move that many of of the people in CG and also just legit investors everywhere they're making. And, and I'm not quite exactly sure, you know, maybe partially because direct mail and other marketing methods, it's shifting. It's like you're saying, it's not that it's becoming less effective. You just have to do more of it and you have to be more consistent with it. But they're wanting to add on that, that, uh, that other marketing method for you. Kind of what was, what was it that made the leap to go from, what you were doing online to what you're doing now with us because it's not like you didn't have a website before you had a website yeah i had a website and i think it was a really nice website i mean yeah. it looked good but it we, it wasn't optimized for seo we weren't really weren't doing anything with it other than using it as a credibility resource mm -hmm. um and uh so you got I got a great recommendation for you uh, for a carrot from uh, as you mentioned Brad Chandler who I respect a lot and so it had been on my to do list I do believe uh, moving forward that more and more of this business is going to shift online direct mail I think will decrease in effectiveness over time I think we still got a long time to go yep. but um, I think it's I think we're missing a segment of the marketplace if we're not effective online and so it had been on my to-do list and um, I love what you guys do I, I don't want to be always one of the things that frustrated me about being online is you can spend a small fortune on a great website and then next year something changes and you've got to redo it yep and I, I just I don't have the desire or the energy at this point with everything else going on to to stay current and that's what I love about what you guys do is you guys keep it going um, you're always tweaking your you know the you know whatever's going on uh, with Google and the search engines to make sure that we're being ranked and we're doing what we need to do to stay um, to stay up there and I didn't not knowing anything about it myself, I couldn't train somebody. And so I hired – and you, I saw you guys had an awesome course on how to do it. So I'm like, well, great. I hired a guy to take his course and start implementing it. And here we go. 
It, dude, he is. So while you were saying that, I was pulling up some some Google searches here. And for those of you watching the video portion of this, um, you know, I, I'm looking at my computer, looking at some Google search stuff. For those of you listening to the podcast version, you guys can always find the video version of this at oncare.com forward slash cast to watch the video version of it because we do have both. And yeah, man, it's been, it's been really cool. Like one of the phrases in the Phoenix market, um, I remember even a month or two ago, you're at the bottom of page one for it. And this one really competitive phrase, you're number four right now. Um, sell my house fast, Phoenix, which that's a tough market. That's a, that's a crazy tough market. And I want to I want to kind of clarify this for everyone. What what you just said there, Martin, was um, you have a virtual assistant that you found who is going through our three lead per day course and implementing the things along with advice from our team. So whenever your VA has questions, they reach out to us or they come on a, a, a mastermind call or hop on a strategy mm -hmm. call or something like that. And we help through, help you through it. And that's one thing I want people to be clear that we're not doing Martin's SEO. We just make it really easy with his website to make the website um, have a better chance of ranking. Uh, we keep ahead of the technology curve. So you don't have to, like you mentioned, especially on mobile. Um, and then you decided you're like, man, I don't have the time to implement the SEO side and I'd rather just find a VA to do it. And that's what you did. And it's working. And um, I just, this is something that's kind of, that's really cool too. So as, as that ranking climbs, your leads are going to keep on getting more consistent. But then I pulled up the Grand Rapids market, man, and you're, you're climbing uh, page one in the Grand Rapids market for a couple of phases awesome. too. So it's going to be interesting seeing that start to mature and see what happens there. I'm excited for you. Thank you. In a big way. So how, how did you, people might be wondering like uh, about the VA, how did you find your VA? Well, uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, one of them is called Upwork. Mm -hmm. uh, you can advertise around the world. You can go to Craigslist. You can advertise. Uh, depending on what market you're looking in, there's there's specific websites and for the in the Philippines and and in different areas. Um, so I just uh, I, I like Upwork. I do a lot of my postings there, but I also use Craigslist. I also use some of the others uh, like Indeed or whatnot. But uh, I've had the best success with. Uh, with Upwork and also with Craigslist to find uh, VAs. And then uh, I got to be candid. I don't think I'm the best person at hiring, but just like anything, if you just stick with it, maybe the person's not the best person. You have to let them go. Well, just do it again. Find somebody else. You yep. will find somebody good and you'll get better at the pro in the process of, you know, trying to find that person up front. So, uh, but that's one of the benefits too. I would encourage anybody, if you're not part of a mastermind or you're know, a group where you can uh, benefit from the wisdom of others, it's definitely worth it. You mentioned Collective Genius a couple of times. A huge resource for me is just being able to bounce things off other investors, find, learn from them. What do you hire? What do you look for? And I've implemented a lot of those things and it's really helped me. Mm -hmm. And on, so you mentioned Upwork. So guys and gals, that's upwork.com. Check it out. We, we've used them before and I'm actually looking for another writer on there right now too. So it's a great, great resource for all kinds of stuff. One, one bit of advice I'll throw at people um, just kind of reading you know, between the lines here with with this last five minutes here is, you know, Martin went out there and found someone who had some proficiency in the online stuff. They don't have to be an SEO person. They don't have to be a web developer. They just have to be decently technical. And then the next thing is um, if you have to you have to give them something to go off of a process of training. And that's one thing that most VAs that will find, let's say it's on Upwork or wherever, even if they say that they do SEO well, most of the time that they don't, you know, most of the time their SEO is going out there and buying a bunch of crappy links <laughs> that don't help you out. So I, I usually don't look for the, the really fancy big SEO virtual assistant. I look for someone who's pretty technical, can do some basic website stuff, might know a little bit about SEO, um, mainly because I want them to follow our process. And that's kind of what you did there. You, you turned over our training over to them. And then the next part that's really important guys and gals who are watching this, is especially if you're bringing in someone who is not that expert at that thing, SEO or whatever, that third layer is you need to add on um, that on the call resource for them. So as they're going through a course, no matter what kind of course it is, that person's always gonna have questions that only an expert that has been doing it for years is gonna be able to answer really quickly. And so that's kind of the key that, that I would suggest people find is if you wanna have um, a VA do your SEO or do something else like that, you can, but they have to have a really good training process to follow. And then they yeah. have to have good access to someone who is an expert who can answer their questions when they get stuck. And that's kind of where we filled the gap for you. And I think that's why it's working yeah. for them. 
Absolutely. And, and just to add to that, too, I think if you're going to hire somebody specifically for one task, then you probably want somebody that's pretty proficient in that task. Mm -hmm. However, for me, what I've learned through this process, and this may not be the same for somebody listening to this, but I want to, I'm building a company and a brand and I want loyalty first and foremost. So for me, I was looking primarily at, at issues such as character, um, integrity, the longevity, possible longevity of a relationship. Obviously, nobody's going to commit to you for years in advance. But if I saw somebody that I wanted to have on my team, possibly for a long time, I'll pay them more than average and I'll invest in them. I'll give them training. So the guy I hired, he didn't know a lot about SEO, but he saw a lot of value in learning about it. So that's a way I could add value to him and not just get value from him hmm. is by saying, hey, I'm going to connect you up to these carrot guys. They're awesome. You are going to learn stuff the right way and you're going to just ex really expand your skills. And that was a big part of the appeal to him to work with me is he was going to get something too. He was going to expand and grow personally and professionally. And by doing that, I've earned the loyalty of somebody who will probably stay with me for a long time. Mm -hmm. I love it, man. Dude, so let's transition, if you wouldn't mind, the last few minutes um, into that, that deal that you closed. So it's your first online deal of, of hopefully many. And um, kind of what, how did that come in? So you mentioned it came in through the search engines, but what happened after that? So the lead came in, what happened? What type of situation was the seller in? <laughs> Truthfully, Trevor, I, I have a, a, a great acquisitions guy that handles this. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been involved in every aspect of it. So That's I can cool. tell you what I know. But um, and we've had other online deals too. This wasn't the first, but it was the most lucrative. Yeah. Um, but because she found us online, and uh, she watched the, uh, the the webinar, the video that I referenced earlier, so that that real credibility enhancer for us. And so when she met, and it was a it, she was somebody that um, I'm trying to remember because I did ask about it. Um, I, I believe her mother died. She was caring for her mother. And now she just wants to relocate. She wants to move to another city, be closer to her sister. I think it was something to that effect. And um, it took a couple of months. We went back and forth a few times. She met with, with Joel, my acquisitions uh, person here in Phoenix, several times. And she just ended up coming back to him and saying, you know, I just really like you guys. I really like the way you do business. I really like how upfront you've been with me. Our offer was 20000 less than the best offer she got and she still went with us because she believed in what we do and that she had confidence that we would solve her problem and give her a trouble-free transaction. So I don't know, I know it's not maybe as much detail as you're looking for, but that's about what I know. No, dude, the, the, the funny, I'm writing this down right now. The funny thing is um, this call, the, the cool thing about this call is it's starting to create this theme, which I love because the theme really is, is how are you going in there and building value in your marketplace where you're not competing on price as your main differentiator. And so this one you offered 20 grand less than another offer that came in and you ended up you ended up netting what what was it that you guys ended up netting on that deal? We netted I think somewhere around 32,000 on that deal. Okay. So 32k or so on the net. And then earlier in the call you were talking about the same thing where hey you're going in and while your, your offers might not be as high, your overall package of the credibility that you guys are delivering is trumping that. I love it. So that right there, if, if people listening to this get nothing else out of this call except for that, um, that, okay, I need to pull away and look at the perception that my sellers, that my buyers are having of our company. Look at the perception. Let me see if I can build value in my offering over and above thinking that the only value I have is a higher price or quicker close. Um, you know, let me build in the credibility that I'll close on time, that I have integrity, that there's this overall package of I can work with you and you're probably going to deliver on what you say. And that's what it looks like you guys are just crushing it at. Um, which in this day and age, we try to do the same thing here with Carrot. In this day and age, it's just kind of funny that in general, mediocre experiences are very normal. Yeah. And um, oftentimes you don't, have to, you don't have to be insanely different or insanely better to crack through and have an amazing experience for people. That's um, right. That's crazy. Dude, that's awesome. So a couple quick questions for you, then we'll wrap this puppy up. Um, and this is kind of get a peek into what you're doing. One of our core values here at Care is consistent, never-ending improvement. It's just something I'm so passionate about and I love, and we try to foster our team to do the same thing. 
Um, what are you what are you learning right now? What, what is there anything you're learning right now or a particular book or a particular topic that you're just like diving in on and going, man, I want to nail this? <laughs> well, for me, I'm I'm really honing in on leadership. I always thought I had leadership skills, uh, but um, all right, I kind of fancied myself as a leader. Yeah. But now that I actually have a company to build and grow, it's not just my family that needs to eat. There's a lot of people that are feeding their families based on my ability to build and grow and lead this company. And so that's really my focus is how to how do I hire the right people and how do I inspire them uh, because it's all tied together. If they're not inspired, they're not going to do their best. They're not doing their best. We're not going to get as many deals. We don't get as many deals. We're not going to be profitable, et cetera, et cetera. It's all ties together. We, for all of us to succeed, for any of us to succeed, we all have to succeed, and we all have to do our. We all have to, uh, you know, just be all in. And that's what I'm looking for is to build a culture of with that mentality, and that all hinges on me. I'm the leader. I set the pace, and so. It really, at the end of the day, if my company doesn't look the way I want it to look, it doesn't act the way I want it to act, it's a reflection of me. And uh, that's really my focus is to grow myself personally, professionally, so that I can be that guy to take this company so that all the, my employees can experience the success that they're wanting to achieve. I love it, man. On that topic, it's funny. I am going through the exact same leadership uh, <laughs> binge as you. And these are three of the books on my desk right now. Have you read any of these ones? There's The Advantage. There's... Um, five dif- dysfunctions of a team. There's H3 leadership. Um, then I've got one more at home that I'm actually in the middle of right now. Have you ever, have you read any of those ones yet? I I haven't, but I'm going to write those down. I'll uh, I'll, I'll need to get, I'll need to get your mailing address, man. I'll I'll get I'll send you out a little little care package on the leadership oh, side. Thanks, um, man. Yeah, dude. So last question here. Um, what what is it? One thing I'm really passionate about is having your business matter, like rather than just the revenue. So putting all the revenue aside, what is it that excites you so much about your business, about what you're doing in the entrepreneurship world on the impact that you're hoping to make? Wow, that's a great question because that really comes back to the heart of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I'll be candid with you. Right now, I was making more money when it was just me and my assistant. When I was just out there wheeling and dealing and uh, um, I was good at what I did, I made more money. I'm, right now, I'm putting everything back into this company. So it's definitely not about more money. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that eventually someday that there will be a payoff. Of course, who wouldn't, right? Yeah. But the payoff for me is is that reason that I gave you initially is I want to build good relations with my, my life. I want to go to bed at night knowing I'm making a difference. Um, I can make a difference in my clients' lives by giving them a simple stress-free transaction. But let's face it, most people aren't going to sell more than one house to us. Mm -hmm. It's a one-time deal. It's not a long-term relationship for the most part, even though we do have, I'm proud to say, a number of repeat clients. This one lady, we bought, uh, I think we just bought our fifth house from her. Oh, wow. So we're excited about that. Um, So definitely you do the right thing. That'll happen too. But to put um, to make a long-term difference in people's lives, I see that not so much through the sales side of my business, you know, interfacing with our clients, but through the team that I'm building. And that's really my focus is I want to build a company that people are proud of, that people are proud to work for, and I can be proud to to run and uh, that we all can derive some meaning from um, being in an environment where we're helping each other get better and get stronger and uh, and grow and to challenge each other every day. So that's really what fires me up at this point. Dude, that's what I'm excited about. I love it. I love it. Well, Martin, I appreciate the heck out of you coming on this Carrot Cast, man, and sharing some of the things that you've been doing and you're doing so much more than we had time to dive into today. So, um, I know you're a wealth of, of resource and love to maybe have you back on in the future. Um, yeah, on, on another topic, I, I'd love to actually to dive into the leadership side and also the team building side. Cause that's something like, so I'm really passionate about right now. And it's definitely a big learning curve for myself. So maybe we can save that for another, another carrot cast, but dude, I appreciate the time. Uh, keep going out there and crushing it. How can people find out about you? I know you're in the different markets and, and you know, you're selling properties and stuff. How can people find out about you if they want to work with you, buy properties from you, or sell a house to you? Even? Absolutely. No, thank you for that. But um, so, but before I even say that, just let me say I just want to say thank you to you, just for um, putting our on, making our online presence so strong. You just it's just a, been a real pleasure to work with you guys. You do what you say you're going to do, and just that alone is a true differentiator. Cool. Uh, I think in both our businesses, and that's just a huge thing. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, so to find me, it's my. if you want to sell a house to me, my website is thetrustedhomebuyer.com. Again, that's the 
trustedhomebuyer.com. Or if you just want to sign up and watch our webinar or whatever, uh, or if you know somebody that needs to sell a house, definitely we'd be happy to uh, help them out. And if you're looking at buying investment properties, uh, you can go to Topaz Wholesale Property. Dot com. So Topaz, like the gem, and so T-O-P-A-Z, wholesaleproperty.com. Martin, amazing, man. Have a, have a great rest of the week. Everyone listen to this call. Make sure you write down a few things, okay? One of the biggest takeaways you can have from this call, like I said, is really pull back and look and see in your own business, in your own life, are you doing the little things right? Are you going out there and presenting that professional appearance to your clients and, and also showing that as a differentiator in your business rather than just looking at price? And like Martin said, if he's going to be competing on price, he would get beat up in a big way. They're not competing on price. They're competing on everything around it, and they're winning. And if you guys can just do that right, focus on that the next six weeks, six months, six years, it's going to put you light, ahead, uh, light years ahead of the rest of the people. So Absolutely. Everyone, go check out the rest of the CarrotCast episodes on carrot.com forward slash cast. And give us ratings on iTunes. So there's going to be a link below this if you're, if you're watching this on our website. If you're on iTunes, check, uh, help over to the the review section, give us a review and uh, give us a quick rating. And uh, that's one of the ways that we can help get this this podcast out to more people to help more people. Martin, any parting words for you before we go? No, just thanks again, Trevor. It was a pleasure. Awesome, dude. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.